Aperture. Uh, thank you, Leslie, and I just want to um, thank Aperture for having us here. So again, my name is Jeanette Spicer. I'm the Education Manager at Magnum Photos in New York. And thank you to Vika and Susan for being here. Um, so to just give you guys a little bit of context as to how this conversation came to be, um, a few months ago I started at Magnum and I was given the directive to check out some of the photographer's archives sift through their work and I was immediately struck by the overlap in several ways between Vika and Susan's work. So the first being that they joined Magnum in their mid-20s, um, obviously very different times generationally, and so then I started looking more into their work and thinking about their practice, and what I started seeing was a pretty intense overlap in terms of how they're engaging with their subjects pretty intimately, um, the necessity for collaboration, the ways in which they were um, dealing with the exchange between photographer and subject. And through their final um, product and book form, you could see that come to fruition in terms of the um, use of text from subjects, the subject's artwork, um, Bika's work specifically, some of the subjects will write directly onto the photographs or around the photographs. So just, I kept seeing this need for an exchange between subject and photographer. And I think in documentary photography, sometimes there can be a question around the give and the take and how you kind of grapple with that as a photographer. So I started thinking about how interested I would be in hearing the two of them have a conversation. And that is how this started. So <laughs> I'm very glad that we were able to get Pika here and have Susan here. And uh, that's basically the basis for this conversation for this evening. So we are going to start with Pika's work to give you a visual context of an overview of her practice. And then we'll go into Susan's work after that, and then go into a deeper conversation, um, the three of us, about their work. So, and then we will have a Q&A, and then there will be a book signing. So we have a lot to do. So, Vika, if you want to start showing some of your work. Great, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, and for publishing my book. Uh, it's very nice. I think I'm very happy with the result. Um, I want to introduce as maybe be, um, so the book I am I'm recently published uh, with Aperture, of course. Um, but before doing this, I want to show two of my other books because they are very much connected uh, in the way I make the work. And um, when, as it may be, I actually start to question my whole practice, what I did before. Um, so um, this is my first book, Umenia. Um It's made when I when I still when, when I was still studying. A photography as my most like my last uh, final work uh, and as all my projects I like to just go somewhere and see what happens and then decide um, what I do on the spot because I think if you uh, think too much about the end result when you start I think you, you really narrow things too much down and uh, so the only thing I knew was that I wanted to travel with the Trans-Siberian train across the country and I thought I would take images on the train and mainly <coughs> images outside. Uh, but the problem was that I didn't have much money and, um, and also the villages where I wanted to go, they didn't have hotels. So as a solution, I asked someone, and it was mostly winter, so very cold to sleep on the streets. So I asked someone uh, I met in Moscow um, if she would write uh, a letter for me, um, asking people if I could spend the night in their homes. Uh, and this is what I did the first uh, night. And a woman, like, I just because I didn't speak Russian, right? And no one speaks English, so uh, I, I, I tried and I tried, and suddenly a woman said I could come to her place. And this opened, this actually changed everything. Um, for the first time, uh, I felt com comfortable with photography. Because uh, before I was always, I always was thinking that I was a street photographer in a way, and it felt not very comfortable. I felt like that I was stealing photos of people all the time. And with people um, inviting me in, uh, I, I started to take, um, not this one, that's the only one, only picture from outside in the whole book. 
but I started to um, yeah, take uh, pictures in the intimacy of people. Um, so I decided that this would be my project. Um, so in the book, there's no images of the train anymore, and every night I try to find another place to spend the night. Um, so these are just a few images of the Russian project. Uh, for me, not knowing the language was also quite important. Um, I have to, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, it goes both ways. I have to observe the people with each other all the time. Uh, so in total, um, and I felt, and actually in Russia, I felt like I could get so close to the people because I didn't speak uh, Russian. So, yeah, these are just... So I went there three months only, and then published the book. And then after this project, I wanted to do the same uh, approach in a place where I spoke English, or I spoke the language. And for a long time, I wanted to go to the States uh, and see what really happens here. So um, I uh, continued the project here, and I, I traveled eight times, eight trips through the States. Um, in the beginning, I only hitchhiked because I uh, still didn't have much money. And uh, I hitchhiked and for six trips, and in the last two trips, I rented the car. And that's when I started to take landscapes, uh, landscapes photos. Um, so it's again the same. Like every night, I find I try to find another place uh, all over the United States, and I only stay for one night, which is quite important in the project. Because the feeling of me, um, yeah, being a stranger, like this short encounter is quite important. Because we both know me and the people I photograph that I'm going away the next day, and for me it's very special to only have this short period of time. I think you share probably more if you know you will never see each other again anymore. Um, so it was every night was quite in, like intense and very intimate. Uh, many stories, but we don't tell the stories now. <laughs> Um, yeah. So every night is really a surprise. Um, and now the photos, because now I speak the language in, in the United States, uh, and actually I, I feel like the pictures are changing because I can speak with the people and we share in a different way. Uh, before I photograph, many people start to uh, uh, share their lives and really talk about their lives. So. This makes me feel look different, like makes me uh, look different at them, um, which changes my photo photography. I think it's more portraits, while in Russia it was more like an atmos uh, atmosphere kind of photos. And then we come to um, as it may be. Um, actually, um, let me show. You. Actually, when I was um, working, I always do many projects at the same time. I can't uh, focus on one only because it's too much. Sometimes you need a break and like think about something else. So I was invited. Um, a Belgian guy, Jan Beke, invited four uh, Belgian photographers to come to Egypt during the revolution uh, as an assignment, actually. And we were all, that was actually right after I came from a trip from the States. So I was super tired, I didn't sleep much. Uh, uh, so he would invite us to do something and make a book together and an exhibition. And um, we decided to not show the revolution, so not show what was happening on Tahrir Square, but do something else, like photograph in the shadow of the revolution. Uh, so no no pictures of um, fighting and so I went there with Harry Greyart, who is also Magnum, um, Philippe Close as a La Bertrand. Uh, and I initially I thought I'd do something totally different again. Uh, I don't want to spend the night with people, I want to sleep well. Um, and uh, I, I, I thought again maybe I should take pictures on the street. Uh, I think every project, every new project starts with thinking that I'm a street photographer. So I started to go around in the in neighborhoods and see what would come to me. And very fast, I realized that um, um, it was like people were very friendly in a way, but they never invite me. Like they would invite me for tea, but and on the front, like drinking tea on the just in, in in front of their house, 
or maybe in the first room uh, in their house. But and this is most mostly like the most beautiful room in the house. But they never, they had always this, their curtains closed. They never would invite me in. And photography was very difficult as well for different reason, reasons, uh, cultural reasons, religious reasons. I could never. Many women didn't want to be photographed, of course, um, and uh, also because of the revolution, because. Um, there were even adver adver there were um, advertisements on TV uh, that the people couldn't trust any foreigners because I could be a spy. We could be spies. So this was quite um, a difficult time to photograph. So and I, I become became more and more curious about what was happening after happening behind these curtains. So I decided uh, to, if I want to do this project of sleeping in people's homes again, this is the place where it's very interesting and where I should do it for the last time, because it seemed uh, it really it really seemed um, impossible, and I was trying. I, I really wanted to try to gain the trust in a place where there's no trust and where many people, where everyone is pushing each other not to trust each other anymore. So this assignment, uh, well, I did this for, I went three times for the assignment, and then we made a book of all of us four together, but the revolution was still going on and many things were happening, and I felt like um, it's not over, so I went back many times for six years, uh, or even seven, yeah. Um, so every night again, I tried to find a place to spend the night, which was in the beginning uh, difficult. Uh, it, sorry, in the beginning it, it, it was easier, but at, in 2017 it was really impossible to find a place because more and more people didn't trust me. And then uh, on a certain moment, uh, I was uh, I wanted to publish the book. I had this publisher in Belgium. And I was making a dummy at home, uh, like we always do, like see which pictures fit next to uh, behind each other. Uh, so we were making, I was making this dummy, and in a way it felt very uncomfortable. Uh, I didn't like anymore what I was doing. I didn't like the book. Uh, I mean, I was kind of happy with the images, but I felt more and more as an outsider. Um, and it felt really uh, as a Western point of view book. Uh, because photography was um, is actually, it was not really possible. And then it would be weird to publish a book with only pictures. And many people didn't want to be in the photos and uh, they're not in the book. Uh, um, so I felt very bad for a long time. And for six months, I didn't want to publish it. So it was laying there and I was thinking about how how can I solve, how, how to solve this problem? Um, so I decided after six months uh, to go back to Egypt uh, and to um, show like with this physical dummy that I made myself and to show the book to people, to other people. Um, one, one family, the, the family in the left upper side, you can see the picture of the pigeon there. That's the only family I saw back. Uh, but the other people were people uh, that I I never met. And I traveled again to the same places where I photographed. And I asked about 50 people what they thought about the book. And the people were all like more on average of the Egyptian people, like farmers, uh, people who were very rich, or uh, people who were very conservative, who would never ever let themselves to be photographed and people who were very open-minded, uh, and even people who couldn't write. Um, and then their son or little daughter would write for them. So I asked them to write on the images, and um, on the photos, uh, people start to have conversations with each other about these different topics, about religion, about um, culture, about photography, which was for me very interesting as well. And if they won't, if they dare to write about politics, they sometimes did. Um, this is the first image of the book. It says, let me go. Uh, 
uh, advice, I don't know if you can read it, advice, I think you should start the book all over again, there's pictures um, that express something and are about Egyptian civilization. So people start to, yeah, not liking the book and like the book. And um, So in the book I published, there is a takeout book, uh, like a little booklet that you can take out and you can put it under uh, the images so you can see the translations and so you can see what people write on them. Uh, but it's nice to just yeah, go through it. I don't this, this, this image is all about trust and why people would trust take me in and why not. And I think I was also have, thinking about um, like I could have an essay written by someone uh, probably again a Western person or someone who knew a lot about the uh, revolution and about the time when I was taking the pictures. Uh, but it also I also felt like I couldn't do it. I think I wanted to tell the story through the voices of the people themselves. Um, yeah, As, like this one. Yeah, they talk about, like often they they would say, for example, someone would say something about Morsi, the current the president. Uh, back then, or CC, the current president, and then someone else would say, for example, um, uh, I don't like what you say, uh, you shouldn't say it because, because you will be in trouble. And it's simple words, but only that says so much about, uh, about the society there. And many people would also um, uh, recognize themselves in the images uh, and start to cry if they actually saw the book. Uh, here someone is suggesting me uh, uh, my phone number is on the book uh, and they're suggesting the people who read the book uh, to call me if they want to donate people uh, if they don't want to donate money to this to this family so if you want to um, yeah but I think my time is up um, this woman um, I didn't take this photo uh, she just really liked the book and uh, wanted to be in there. Uh, <laughs> so, um, this is what I did. And no one likes this image, of course, except for one person who wrote, wrote on it. Uh, and this, maybe this has a last image because I really like uh, what someone wrote on it. Because um, in this period when I was making this book, I was really questioning photography as well. And, how like my position as a photographer and uh, what like what do I actually do and why do I actually do it and this person wrote on this image um, you have lived through one snapshot an hour or two maybe a night uh, just a picture but you haven't experienced what is in the picture so yeah I, I can't really add something to that <laughs> but I get to see them to answer <laughs> I don't think I'll answer that. <laughs> I, I was just, oh, I was just saying, Mika, though, uh, she's actually staying with me and we're sneaking the conversation that I've been so happy to have and always want more of. So I'm going to um, not show the various other books except to say that kicking off of what you've said already, I have so many things I want to ask you. I'm going to try and get back to um, sharing a little bit about one project, if I can get this to, why is it not doing it? It's not, it's not, it's deciding to re rebel already. Um, I was just thinking, every system is falling apart. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that, you know, when you were thinking about street photography, and I felt like I couldn't resist, it's not in the PowerPoint, um, saying, so this was my version of street photography, even though I also did not self-identify in any way as a street photographer. I mean, the idea of, you know, grabbing and gun running and kicking, and uh, Henri has his own definition okay, um, of uh, the, uh, the the the, not the decisive moment, but the moment that's grabbed and run, that you run with and run away with. Um, there was lots to talk about there, but I'm not going to start there. Um, except to say that, in a way, I think we have both complementary and contrasting ideas about collaboration, and hopefully between quickly going through something to give you the meat to also think about 
uh, time moving through our work, um, I would say the Nicaragua project, in a way, was not collaborative in the making at the first stage of the work, and it was very, it wasn't classic street photography either, though by being on those streets, and I wish I was there tonight, there on their streets, and if you don't know what's going on, I hope you'll find out, because those streets look even more like what I photographed 40 years ago right now. So I think of myself collaborating um, in a documentary, maybe tradition, bringing back the work over many decades and re-interrogating the photographs, first by finding the people in the photographs in a film called Pictures from Revolution, and when Aperture and I, and Leslie and I, thought about reprinting this book, and it's amazing, it's the 40th anniversary of the next year of this insurrection, uh, we developed uh, something called the Look and Listen app. And I'm not gonna show that tonight, because I don't want, we don't have really enough time to show many bodies of work, but the important idea was that you would look at a photograph and that you would hear the person in the photograph. Hear the person, not read the person. I had done the reading about people, but I wanted to get to the audio. And so if any of you are interested, you'll, you'll experience that uh, through an iPhone app that allows you to, the photograph triggers a video clip in which you hear the person in the photograph. I'm gonna focus on this one um, more recent project. Um, whoops, just jumped. It's deaf. Why is it now? It's, it's really rebelling. So anyway, this is a very, this is a project, and, and again, I want to speak about time in the notion of collaboration, not only about people and place, as in Nicaragua, but also ideas. So how ideas dwell in you and take form in different forms over time. So that's sort of what, when I look at this photograph, I'm remembering I was invited to San Francisco in 1991. It was at a time where the notion of domestic violence was not a public defined by a community. DV was very unknown to a public, let's say. So this was a public awareness campaign. I was invited with six other artists to come and be based in San Francisco, make images, and try to find a way to, to represent them. So this is, um, I began with a series of pictures that really were classic documentary evidential of the kinds of wounds and scars I was seeing. And then I discovered that the police had done, a huge, had a huge archive of similar such images of evidential base. The homes that were ripped up. Again, I can't read this because it's way too small on the screen. But the yellow highlighted is the narrative of the police, and I made, I ended up making collages of what the police said when they investigated a case and the photographs that they had made and then went back to the victims and asked for their permission to do what became a public bus shelter poster campaign. Just as a footnote, Irma, whose hands these are, they were sliced up by her husband, um, I just re-met about a month ago. This was made in 91, so when you talk about collaboration, this photograph and this poster is gonna be at SF MoMA next month, and I wanted to know how she would feel about that, not knowing in many years. I saw her about a few years after the incident, uh, but now it's been that much longer, and the question is how do you live with an image over time? She's, of course, her identity is protected, but nonetheless, that's of great concern to me. How would she feel being in this museum in her hometown? Um, so her voice will be at a listening station under the bus shelter poster, which is just a recent addition to this. Um, I'm gonna segue to um, another kind of invitation for a commission in the north of, um, in the northern part of the UK Multi-story, as Leslie mentioned, is a small arts group, regionally based, inviting artists of many kinds to the region to respond. And that sounds fantastic. I'm sure most of you would love such an invitation, and, and I'm sure, again, I would agree, it's terrifying. So, not only you don't know where you're gonna sleep that night, which also was true when I went to the other way, um, but you don't know what you're gonna feel something about and in, in where you're gonna begin the point of engagement. So there's a kind of, whether it's you're wandering a street or you're looking 
uh, as I did uh, when I discovered that in the internet, now this is now 25 years after I did the work in domestic violence in Santa Fe, in San Francisco, where I felt never, it was never complete, even though the bus shelter poster, posters had a very impactful campaign. Um, and I was reading about uh, domestic violence, which was very intense. This is west of Birmingham in northern England. So I began by looking at the over 300 service organizations, trying to read as much as I could about what people were doing. And it all shifted, and I think this is again the point of shifts, which is interesting for us both to talk about, when I walked into one place, which was a refuge that had um, a feeling in it. It's really about the feeling in the space. You know, when you talk about the living room as the welcome room, but you can't go back. Well, the welcome room in this refuge is the only collective space. So again, a refuge has to be protected, its identity, where it's placed in a particular town. The people who are in the refuge, they call it refuge or shelter, we would call it, also have to be protected. So those were the constraints that I was working with or trying to figure out how to work with. Um, and this strategy that evolved was really based on what was of value to that shelter, which was to bring women together first, and they literally did workshops that involved cooking, sitting around a table together, cutting up the vegetables, discovering that actually the stories that they each had interconnected. Um, so we were just doing workshops in the day, in the afternoon, and then in, in the evening in different, in different refuges. Uh, I worked with a small group of other artists in the region, uh, an illustrator, a storyteller, a writer. Um, we began doing workshops. This, I hope you can read. This is such a problem with bad projections here. Uh, I feel like burnt toast. Um, can you read it? Uh, can you read it? Burnt around the edges, right? And it's, she was identifying with, um, food. So the, the workshop was choose anything and start to write how you feel in relation to um, what you see, essentially. So these workshops were in the refuge and, as I said, in the shelters and, um, you know, sometimes in the kitchen, in the living room. People came or went, came if they wanted to stay, they stayed. If they didn't, they passed through. There was no obligation. Um, and then it built a, a, a momentum over several weeks' time. Um, and at a certain point, I wondered where did they go. And it's so interesting, because I hadn't thought about this, but the idea of the room. And so, Biko wandering around Russia with a little piece of paper, can I stay with you, which was kind of bold. Um, it was terrifying for me in this shelter to ask if I could go to the one small private space they had in this shelter, which was theirs and that nobody else had access to. So it may look very obvious as a photograph, um, as in some ways because you just think, oh, she just dropped in, you know? How did she get there and be there and let them have her there in this remarkable way? And I can only say the starkness of these landscapes was so striking, how little they had um, and how carefully they guarded it, um, what they could do with them. And I immediately began to feel that I knew this was a transient population, so I went to, with, with the idea that I would, um, both as I interviewed people, I would transcribe that night, the next, the, the same day, I would make prints, I would bring them back, and they would have something from whatever they had shared the day before. This being very much, you know, you were talking about one time, one night only, and in a way this is a, a one night only because you don't know how long people will have to stay. It turns out many stay as long as they need to. Um, but do they want a photograph of the landscape of this particular period of their, uh, of their life? So very quickly I tried to find a way that they could see how we were seeing. So what you're seeing here is a workshop the, the t a room, Carol's room, and then she had made a photograph, a, a collage of her imaginary beautiful home that she hoped to create in the near future. And so this little blue tape indicated, as you can see here, 
we use one of the rooms in the shelter to show the construct of each of these interventions as they were building. So they were, it was kind of like the Magnum pop-up or live lab every day. It was filled, we were filling in the parts of the story that they had contributed. So just again, to give you a sense, this is an environment which obviously the surveillance is very extreme on both the outside and the inside. Women live, leave little notes. So these are some of the photographs I was making of the collective space, um, indicating what they want to share with the woman coming, coming into the shelter. The idea of just the emergency room, which is always available, and each, there were, this was a network of six shelters, Eat, that each of which had one room with almost nothing. And this question of what do you bring, uh, oops, sorry, it's very delicate. Um, you know, what do they stay with? So um, for Janet, the most important thing was creating security and safety for her child. And, um, you know, trying to think of, again, their visual strategies, they can't be revealed to what extent they participate. And this is probably as close as I've ever gotten to where Beek is, you know, very comfortable, which is uh, Tia turned and I captured this moment and then I realized it was okay to photograph her. But it took a while to even imagine that. So when you talk about trust, that is so key and it's so slow and you never know when it will feel right to take that next step. Um, and that is a collaboration, because she knew at that moment, I was there, and this is where we were, though it was, there was no direction to what she should do. And that's maybe a, a point of difference sometimes to think about. This just a, a spread of the book that um, we ended up doing, the perspective of a room, that a room sees many lives going through it, some of which come in with garbage bags, some of which take garbage bags out, and then the reconfiguration of the room, changing, so there's a sequence of the green room, uh, which I always felt was important, that you imagine these rooms being welcoming and then people move on. Um, just a quick sense of, uh, as someone stays, I mean the hardest problem for me, unlike your construct where you plan to be there only one night, I was of course hoping to build relationships as much as I had with carnival strippers, etc. that was impossible. So. Uh, this is the one person who stayed over enough, long enough time to be able to share. And she shared her diary with us, and I'm going to share with you her reaction when I brought the book back. Because again, I think when we're really talking, get lower the sound. Oh, the good one that she got in the book. She's desperate to find herself, of course. <laughs> She's not looking at anything else, right? There I am. Yes. Only I can come up with stuff like that. She's drawn four rooms that she stayed in in the two oh years. My points. Oh my dear. Room eight, ten, big room. You've got nothing there as well. So the diary. Oh, it's been thousand years. Is that still don't? <laughs> so the diary was really important that it could come out of the book and it could be held by any woman who might have to think about some of the issues these women have faced. I'm just going to end with two other things because trying to think about what are you giving back and it never feels it never feels uh, like enough. Um, aside from a book, bringing a book back, and I'm sure you've had this feeling, whether or not they like the photographs, how happy they are, what it means to be in the book, um, even for the children of those who are in the book, etc., etc. We ran a campaign to raise money for the shelter, 
um, which was a whole other aspect of what kind of give back can there be that's appropriate and raise funds and many people not only brought funds but also brought blankets and things that could be useful. Um, and you know, I just want to say that when you then move to another level and you're dealing with another audience and another kind of viewing, um, which this is just was on, on view in Paris, it's another set of relationships that you've invited somebody to be part of, whether or not they fully understand going from this very intimate exchange that you might have to then the form. And I just want to end on something I can't actually visualize on the PowerPoint easily, but I do want you to see it because it's sort of, this is called a view of a room. The other book is called A Room with a View. Uh, a, a room of your own, I'm sorry. And this is a view of a room. The reason I'm showing it to you is because in the space and the spectators in a museum in a meaningful way, I think it's still mysterious whether we make pictures, we have pictures on walls, we make books, how do they feel, what do they think, those who are in them or those who hold them. So I just want to show you a different kind of experiment. So this is a very tiny little book. Um, I gave the, the emergency room photograph was on the wall of the photographer's place in London. And the question was, what do you see? And um, the public who received, this is a little hard to show you, the public received this little card, right, what do you see? And they could respond or not respond. And it was up for about two months before the book was released. And this is a little book of all the things they saw. So what I love about this, and I is just everyone saw something completely different. And if we had another hour, I would be reading you these because they're just kind of amazing. I think we, we're in a process we know so little about all the time. Where there are new layers, new discoveries, new ways to think about what we do. And onward. Thanks. So, I mean, I have questions. I don't know if you have any. Well, I, I just need some light. Uh, well, I find it very interesting this little book you made because without us knowing, we indeed have a lot of connections. Because I, I, like, it's all about how, what I find very interesting, it's all about how one person sees an image and it's not uh, an exact truth, right? So, and this is my work of uh, As It May Be in Egypt. This is also why I did it, because we look at images out of our personal stories and out of our Western kind of view. And it's funny because in the exhibition I had, I did it in two exhibitions already. Uh, I had it in France one and one in The Hague in the Netherlands. And I again printed the same dummy, like exactly the same, because the book that is published here, it's an exact uh, cop, an exact reproduction as the one that I went to Egypt with. And in an exhibition, I printed exactly the same, but it's empty again, and I ask the audience to write on it, uh, which make a part yeah, of a new book. Parallel. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people, and it's interesting, because a lot of people are just, like, again, from a lot of point of view, seeing the images and commenting on the images, and like, I like this idea of continuing uh, with the same photos. Yeah, that makes me think about, Susan, you mentioning how an image kind of lives over time and having such a long trajectory that you have with your work. It makes me think about all the different forms and all the different ways in which photographs can kind of exist and be revived. And I guess I would be, so many questions, I guess I would be curious on that topic how, I what's coming up for me is this idea of, um, interaction with the viewer and with the people that are in the work and how that kind of keeps happening over and over again. Um, so Bika, you mentioning just now that people were writing on the prints, right? Um, I just think that's an interesting thing to kind of, like an interesting checkpoint. Um, but another question that I have specifically is this idea of time and this idea of trust and how I'd be curious to open it up to either or both of you about that is where I think there's an overlap and then also a, a, a bit of a difference in, for example, a room of their own with you, Susan, 
I don't know the exact amount of time that you were there, but obviously more than a night versus and gaining trust uh, with these women who were, you know, in a very specific place in their lives. And then Bika, in terms of the time you mentioned, because you're there for an evening, it does kind of ramp up that level of intensity. But I would just be, I would just be curious to kind of open up this conversation of trust and time and how that works with, you know, getting the images that you, that you get. And, and do you actually shoot every single night? Do you shoot? Yeah, I'm wondering about that. Um, no. Well, um, I'm, I want to get back to what you said, Susan, about how difficult it is of, I find it very interesting, how difficult, difficult it is to ask this question if you can see the room of the girls. And um, for me, it's the same. And you would think, actually, it's getting that more difficult the older I get or the more professional I get, I guess. But um, like, um, this question of can I spend the night in your home? It's something I hate to ask. And some nights I don't. I, I'm just not capable of going uh, in, to someone and asking this question because I just don't dare. And um, for me, once I'm inside, I'm more comfortable and I'm more easy uh, to talk with people because they already said they were, they want to be photographed. Um, so I, I think what we should try and you know, I mean, it's a very, uh, you're, you're speaking of feeling within yourself able to give of yourself, really. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that is the magical part, right? The part of you that knows I, I'm ready to, to enter this world that I don't know. I mean, we both have this not knowing which drives us to want to know, which I love, sure. yeah. I hadn't thought about, but you know, in a way, going not knowing where it's going to take you, which is because I was part of, in the Nicaragua project, a historical unfolding of beyond anyone's imagination. I was very much in that mindset too, but whatever you could grasp at the moment, the fragment of something. But you're also talking about the availability that one has to be, to receive or to listen, which is a lot of work. In your mind, you, um, you know you will probably publish a book and I don't, I hate this feeling. Uh, of not like, and this is like through all these projects for me it was so important to be first as a person there and second as a photographer. But it's true, the more you uh, develop a pro like project, the more it's difficult. And as a solution, like during, I, I had this problem in the Russian project, not really because I just started. And, but um, with the American project, um, like. Sometimes I felt that I was with a family and I felt in a way, oh my god, I'm using them for my own. And this was, it's, the, it's not a feeling I want to have. So, and then I often would say, okay, I can't do this. I have to take a break, like two nights or three nights, go in a hotel just to kind of being able to come back as a person and not as a photographer. And it's a difficult thing, I think. And yeah, we were talking about this earlier, yesterday, about like, um, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, I, want, I don't want to lose this urge of uh, wanting to know and not using people. And this is, I think, when our work is switching and when we start to question photography. And, and they're good questions. I hope you all have them as well in your minds. So are we going to do Q&As? How we, how we, do we, what do we want to do here? We could go on all night, you can tell. And I don't want to exclude you. You're like, you're like eavesdropping on the edge of a conversation we're desperate to have and we never get to have, which you might think we would, but you don't get to. You still have plenty of time for a conversation. Okay, you're, the, you're in charge, you're on time clock. Um, so, you know, to, to follow on that, I think that's a really, um, the, the trust um, is not something you can give anybody a formula for. But I think what you just said as an underlying takeaway for me, that, that separation of being a person versus being a photographer, that you don't want to be a photographer and no longer be the person. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how can you navigate your personhood, your personness, and in, with the camera that, that is the apparatus, is the thing you depend on. Many people use cameras to hide behind, and, and um, some people feel that the camera is the excuse, as I have said, to be somewhere that you don't belong, which has worked in many ways. But it also can be 
seen differently by other people when you have that camera in your hand. So these are all aspects of what we're talking about. I don't know. If yeah, I think it's interesting as well to like what you say now. Like, do you want to be visible, or do you want to, or do you try to be invisible? Yeah. And like, many people say if they see my picture, you look so invisible. But I think it's because I'm very visible. <laughs> and the yeah. and and I shared with Pika that that this show that I was referring to in Paris, I discovered one of the pictures I made very early on, which was. I guess it was a, some long exposure. I'm sitting in a chair. You see just enough of me to be present, but then I get out of the chair and walk out. And so I have to rediscovered that I made this photograph very early. I'm getting a sign louder. Can you not hear me out there? It's because you didn't sit in the front row. You should have sat in the front row. Anyway, so you know this idea that I made a picture when I was I don't know 21 or something, sitting in a chair and then moving out of the chair. So the image gives you a sense of presence and absence simultaneously, or presence and desire to be invisible, you could also say. And when I recovered it only recently, I realized how symbolic it was for my whole practice. It's exactly where, if you can find that place that you're both present, and you also can be invisible, meaning it's not about me. It's not about you, know, you responding and performing for me. And, Performing is an area where we probably have some some differences, so maybe we should touch on that a little. How you feel that edge between when you know somebody is doing something for you, oh. right? Yeah. yeah. And I have a feeling, I, my instinct would be not to oblige them because I'm not comfortable in the, you're doing it for me. I want them to be who they are. I want to pretend I know I'm there, but I don't want them to be thinking about me. And I think you find another space, which I feel in the photography that I don't know if you want to in the new work. Speak you mean, or, yeah, yeah. Well, I think this question about being there first as a person, second as a photographer. Um, actually, I, I was invited in the south of France uh, for to make a book and an exhibition in a little town named Set, and uh, to make a book in one month, like very short. And that's when I think. On this point, my photography really changed a little. Well, no, really changed because I was asked to do an assignment, and I had to produce the work in a short period of time, and it made me freeze because um, I knew the director of the festival. He wanted me to go into people's homes. I didn't want to, so uh, I just I just wandered around again, and I saw people as objects to photograph because they needed to be in this book that I had to, that had to be ready. So it made me not to be able to photograph. So I then photographed for one or two weeks. Uh, and I was wandering ar around at night again. And I started to think, like, I don't want to use people, right? So I started to like go around. And suddenly I had this image in my mind of how I saw the little town or the village. And I thought, maybe I just have to be honest to the people that I'm using them. So to tell my own story through them. And this is when I just, I asked people I saw during the day and I asked if I could visit them at night and then we would make a scene together, photograph the reality to turn it into my own story. And so I did this in sets and now I'm doing a project with a girl I met in Paris through this live lab at Afro Magnum. Uh, and we're doing really a collaboration together. So. Uh, I met her in a, in a strip club and we talked and we got friends and she really likes to perform in LA so um, she, she, she actually sent me a nice email recently to say uh, I will give my whole self to you and you wrap Vika around, around me and then we make something together so this is something we're trying to do like uh, yeah so I think this is more the direction I'm going I feel comfortable with now because I, I, I can't imagine doing this project again with the sleeping over and like being on, trying to be honest in a way. Yeah. Uh, and I thought I loved what you said because of course everyone wants you get to again and again do exactly that. So the challenge for you is to getting out of the box that people put you in, to not perform yourself again and again as you have because there's no, the richness is a new kind of relationship and that's what I love about hearing about. Mm -hmm. This, the woman in Paris, and it'll be a different kind of expression 
of collaboration. So Jeanette, I know you had piles of okay. papers here. Yeah. We're not going to get to all those questions, but what else do you want to Well, I'm just, I'm curious about the idea of the room um, and the way in which you guys, with the work that we've specifically seen tonight, because again, Susan, you've worked absolutely in the exterior yeah. and the interior. And Bika, with your work, I've seen mostly, you know, the interior. And yeah, I'm curious about how you approach the interior. And something that really stands out for me with your work, Bika, is when I'm looking at the Russia work and the United States work and then the work in Egypt, is for me personally, what I start, I start looking for connections um, between all these different cultures. So I start seeing the ways in which people kind of make their own beds and the ways, and I understand that has to do with, you know, certain levels of privilege and certain, you know, it depends on what, you know, whose home we're, we're walking, in, you're walking into and what we're, what we're then seeing as a viewer. But in general, I started to see these connections of family and um, just the intimate nature of the space that we create for ourselves. So, and then when I look at, I kind of love that both of these projects, well, I know you have a multitude of projects, but Susan, a room of their own, and then the three projects you showed. In terms of interiors, I love seeing then this stark difference of such a stark space with your work, Susan, and also how some of the images, and I don't know that they're all here, but when I was looking at your book, we'll see kind of this empty room, and then I'll see the same image, um, you know, the same couch in the same room, but I'm seeing now clothes thrown on the floor and belongings. And so I'm just curious about the ways in which you personify these spaces. And I'm wondering if those belongings kind of for you are indicative of, of the remnants of a person because it is so challenging to make work, I can only imagine, basically without people. Um, and this is kind of a complex question. I think I'm asking eight questions at once. Um, Bika, how do you kind of approach a room as well? Like, you don't necessarily know what you're going to walk into. I'm just curious what you're looking for because I see a thread for me looking at this work. I see a thread of kind of intimacy and family and so <laughs> I'm curious about the room. Do you guys want to talk about how you approach, how you approach these rooms? I'll ask a specific question to Bika from your question. Sure. Do you make, no, I don't, I don't know. Do you find that you, so you go into a, a home, do you make multiple images in a room? Or do you see the part, of the part of the room that you think is the room and then you wait for the moment that someone's inhabiting it? I think it really depends. I think... So you've done both? Yeah, I think when you... Uh, because I never know where I will end up, so it's really a surprise. Uh, so I think once you open a door, you immediately see which corner is the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so then you position yourself, of course, so you can take this photo and like you kind of, I mean, you can guide people in a weird way. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, so, but I must, uh, so you might make multiple images of the one corner that you identify for the most part. Well, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, just, just you know, honest. you know the most in, where the most interesting light is, and like you kind of, that, that that that's what happens the, f the the first minute you enter a room. But then things are changing because, for example, you like oh I, I don't take, because you ask or you or you ask inside like some if sometimes I don't take pictures and sometimes you don't and sometimes like. I of, like I often doubt myself, and I'm like, it's will be impossible to take pictures, or like, uh, I don't know what is happening, and and you're sitting there and you think yeah, it's nothing. Just the idea of walking in and saying, can I make a photograph? I had no idea why. I just was doing it, and that was difficult. And then I brought it back, etc. But the point of the room and those four walls, and figuring out which is the corner is an interesting act of collaboration because at the time of 44 Irving Street, they chose where they wanted to be in the room. And they even, I was working with a 4-5, and they wanted to see the frame to whether or not everything in the room that they wanted to be in the photograph was in the photograph, which was in a way a kind of collaboration, though I hadn't thought of it then. And then in this case, with a room of their own, um, it was so delicate that there was not, I was not going to make more than one image in a room. So maybe I varied it slightly if I hadn't seen 
there was a Coke bottle on the edge of the bed or something, um, I may have read, but I, I walked in and it was very clear, I'll work here. Now they're not there except guiding me into their space. So it's different than you being in a room, waiting for something to happen in the room as it were, seeing the corner with sure. the elaborate whatever it is, right? It's a different process. So I was limited to there is something in the room or not. I thought of, and I think both of our projects have a certain edge of, uh, the room is a portrait. The landscape of the room is a portrait with or without people. That's certainly the feeling I had. It expressed yeah. their state of minds or their state of being, let's say. Yeah, I think for me as well, there's, I, I think, two things to say about the room. Um, well, there's more things, but like maybe that I want to say, like, first, um, the idea of I think I like, I, I thought about it because I, in many of my projects, I put myself in a very uncomfortable position. And um, uh, with people I don't know, um, often at night in dangerous neighborhoods where I can't get out, um, and like being stuck, this idea of being stuck in a place. Uh, and you have to deal with it. You can't go out, and you have to uh, have create, you can't run away from the relationship you're creating. And I think this is something that I, without thinking about it, and maybe I think about it now, but like without thinking about it, it's something that I think I search for all the, I don't know why exactly, but I search for it all the time. And then, uh, second, what I wanted to say I had from your question um, is that I just really like the idea of how, like the night, I, I do, I'm not interested in taking pictures during the day most of the time, but I like the idea of people leaving the streets and coming home in their place where they are, they are with themselves and that they become like more their true self in a way. And this is why I think I, of, I invite myself all the time in people's homes and this ritual we are all doing, myself as well, like before we go to sleep, it's very special, it's very intimate, like this moment with yourself and uh, yeah, this is something I like to like find like find out in this project. I want to underline that idea that you just said was so beautiful. You know about you can't escape the relationship you create. I hope all of you who are photographers out there think about that. That's a very very special insight. That there's some notion that you um, it's not just the trust that's offered you. It's also the responsibility in, in exchange for that. So even if you want to escape the room, you've opened up and created a, the beginning of a relationship, and that may not end just because you walk out of the room. And so that's a whole yeah. zone of, of conversation that we may not get to, but important to think about. Do we have time for it? <laughs> we have time time clock. Clock. Thank you, time clock. <laughs> I'm curious, Susan, about um, looking at your work, the archives of abuse, and then from 91, 92, and then looking now at a room of their own. I'm just curious if you could talk about, there's clearly a lot of overlap there. I mean, you were, you know, approaching the first project and we're seeing the aftermath of this brutality and we're seeing it on the body and we're seeing police reports and then, you know, you said 25 years later, you're, then you're going back to a very similar, clearly very similar theme of domestic violence. But in terms of aftermath, it's in the kind of, one would hope the healing process and, a, and another um, next step of what happens when you're involved in domestic violence. So I'm just, I'm curious because aesthetically there's such different projects. Yeah. Um, and I find it so fascinating. I mean, the archives of abuse kind of popped up for me the other day, and that wasn't a body of work that I was familiar with of yours. So for me, in you know preparing for this talk, it was really interesting to think, to imagine doing some, doing a project, you know, in the early 90s, and then revisiting a project 25 years later, what that must be like. And I think it's so fascinating the way it sort of wraps itself up um, to me, you know, I mean, as a viewer. And I just, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit so about there, that. There are different ways to talk about it. I mean, on one level, I want to emphasize the idea, and I'm sure this is true for you, Vika, is the consequences of choice. You're only in one body at one point in time, 
And so I began that work. I envisioned it as archives of abuse. That was the first chapter, in a sense, and I expected to stay and work with the San Francisco DA much longer. And then I read the news about the Kurds fleeing from northern Iraq into Turkey and immersed myself in a process that I unfolded in a collaborative process with a longer history than I had lived, and the Kurdistan book took me over. And the work took me away. And I think it's very important to note, even going back to what we were just saying about you open a door, you begin a relationship, you have a responsibility to it. So only a month ago, going back to prepare for the San Francisco show, did I see Irma again, did I see the district attorney again, to talk about how, what was left behind that could still be reinvigorated. But the other part of it is not only you move your body, but there is something that remains within you, and that's what I was saying about the dwelling, something dwelled within me that this was unresolved, there was more maybe to think about or find a way towards. And I'm not sure I have the answer to that. That might be down down the road in a sense. You know, but I know that the project with multi-story evolved because I had done that work. Otherwise I would never have necessarily or maybe I wouldn't say never, but not necessarily have found myself in that refuge, wanting to spend the time in that refuge. You asked about time and it is interesting this Bika referred to how many trips she made back and forth to Egypt. I don't, I wasn't counting the trips, but um, the striking thing was not, in your case, finding different people. I was hoping to find the same people. And yet at the same time, I was happy that I didn't find them, which meant that they had moved on, they had made new lives somewhere. And once they did, they were out of circuit, meaning the, in, the, the shelter didn't know where they were. And that was, a good sign. So at, at the same time, for a photographer that you hope to s extend a relationship. Um, so even though I came back with 25 books signed for very particular people, I still don't know if they each got them because they may be out of circuit and onward to a whole other part of the world that you know I may never find them. So that was the first time that happened for me. Oh, she's saying it's okay. okay. time. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Susan and Mika. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a mic? Somebody have a mic for the audience? How are we doing this? Uh, <clears throat> since you're here from... Uh, Magna, uh, Henri Cartier Bresson, who changed my life as a documentary filmmaker, mm -hmm. said when I heard uh, taking photographs is like making love, mm -hmm. and you have to love the people, places, and things you you're photographing. My question is, as photographer, do you have a relationship in the moment when you're taking photographs, and now? You're, you're thinking about doing books, and how does that shift in your mind work? How do you, that trade-off of being in the moment, now you're thinking about being an object yourself? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think um, for me personally, I find it super important if I make work in the beginning stage that I don't think about an audience. I think many photographers are different, but for me, I don't want to, because it's limiting yourself, right? So I, I just want to uh, like go my way, find my way through myself and not through the people that are looking at my work. And I think when I come back home, uh, that's when I start to think about an audience and then I probably go back, like because we don't do one trip, so several trips. So the more, the longer we work on a project, the more we, Start to think about the end result, but at the beginning, I think it's very, for me personally, it's very important to be in my own zone, and it's probably then I think the the work becomes more personal and more true to myself. And my own. Yeah, but that's my personal. This is such a loaded question. I really, <laughs> I mean, I love this idea. How was Henri making love to all those people he made those photographs? <laughs> 
I mean, that's quite something right there to talk about, you know. I mean, we're going to reduce speaker to the one night stand and we're going to talk about that. I mean, the love that goes on and on and on over decades with the people you once loved. And I mean, there, we could go really far on that one. I, I mean, I just think, yeah, you have to, there's some, that's what I was saying to Vika, I mean, some being, being open to and giving yourself, giving yourself some part of yourself, being able to give some part of yourself with no guarantee that there's anything back.